Hey doctors, it's Mark Slater here from Prime Spine Consulting, and today is a special day. Um, so you want different results in your personal injury practice, and we don't want to be a commodity, right? So whether you're new to personal injury, maybe you're just getting less than five PI patients a month, or maybe you haven't even started, but this is a path that you want to take, or maybe you're a seasoned pro in personal injury. Maybe you've been practicing for five, 10, even 20 years. You're getting 20, 30, maybe even 50 PI patients a month, but you've just hit that ceiling and you need different actions. You need to do different things to get different results. Well, today um, I'd like to introduce somebody that can help you with that because we have to figure out what your point of differentiation is. And if you can share that message in your conversations with attorneys and doctors, you're going to grow your personal injury practice because you're not going to be just like everybody else. Now, I'm going to introduce Dr. Cielo here um, for one specific point of differentiation. Uh, he is really good at diagnosing ligament laxity or ligamentous instability. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let me go ahead and uh, invite Todd into the interview here. Hey, Todd, Dr. Cielo. Hey. Welcome to the interview. Thanks for doing this for me. Absolutely. Love to have us. Yeah. So a brief introduction of Dr. Cielo. Uh, Dr. Cielo graduated Life College in 1998. Uh, by the way, he also graduated the uh, University of Florida in 1993. Todd, is that correct? 93. Yeah, I know that because we went to school together at the University of Florida. Uh, and I want to talk about that in just a second. Um, he's been in solo practice since 1999. 70% uh, of his practice is family care. The other 30% is personal injury and second opinion. Uh, he's an expert at giving second opinions. Uh, he created a company called DXD Software 11 years ago for specifically for the chiropractic uh, profession. He's been lecturing to chiropractors for 10 years for continuing education credits in the state of Florida and lecturing to attorneys to educate them on the lines of menstruation, uh, DXD technology, and AMA guideline correla correlation. So again, Todd, uh, Dr. Cielo, uh, welcome to the interview today. Thanks for having me. You got it, man. So tell me a little bit about uh, why you got into this lines of menstruation and tell me how you got exposed to this little deeper diagnosis than obviously most chiropractors are, are skilled to give. Uh, tell me how you got into this uh, work. After about 12 or 13 years of doing personal injury in the Tampa Bay region, you know, we're all experts at subluxations, adjustments, and report of findings. And we take x-rays and then we do an MRI and it's just really a cookie cutter that we've all been through. And maybe as an associate, and we've gone through that protocol. And after about 12, 13 years, I go, you know what, w what's different about us? And how can I differentiate myself from the rest of the pack? Two doors down, two miles down. And in the AMA guidelines, it's real specific. There's six pages out of 600 that scream chiropractic flare. And that's lines of menstruation. It's George's line. And it's hit very well. And as I dissected it more, it talked about millimeters and degrees, permanent injury, no ifs, ands, or buts, no caveats. And I said, you know what, let me develop something that is real specific for George's line that we learned with a slide rule and pencil. And then let me perfect it from a personal injury marketing slash educating the attorneys. And that's where I'm at. Okay. And from a high level view, Todd, so you have this specific procedure that you do with x-rays and are they flexion, extension, lateral views that you do this on? Yeah, it's real simple. The guidelines asks for three views, flexion, extension, and neutral. And basically at the end of the day, we're just trying to stress out um, facet joints, uh, the ALL and the PLL of the uh, spine. And then it's asking very specifically, please measure it in millimeters and degrees to 0.01 degrees of accuracy, and that's what we do. Okay, and so you generate this report that gives you this report of findings about what those measurements mean. And what does that do when you present this information to let's say a new attorney that you're trying to build a relationship with, or maybe even an existing attorney? How does that conversation go? So when I market this to attorneys, because at the end of the day, even though we're all uh, DCs and, and we call ourselves doctors, you're still a salesman. 
And when I go to these attorneys, whether they're 30 years old or they're over 65 years old, I say, this is not the Mercedes 80s anymore. The Mercedes 80s was very simple for attorneys. Regardless if you're 15 years old or 92, you got an MRI report, you folded it up. You don't even look at the, at the uh, medical terminology. Arthritis doesn't matter. You send it in, they tender the limits, they got 33% like that. Now, anytime that you're 12 years old to 92 years old, whatever's on that MRI, they always say that's pre-existing. So the nice thing about lines of mensuration in Georgia's line, there is no caveat. It doesn't care about arthritis. doesn't care if you played rugby. doesn't matter if you're in the NFL. doesn't matter if you had 19 car accidents. Did the bone move? Yes or no? Yes. How much? Categorize it. Stamp it. 25% permanent injury. Okay. So let's say you're not using this procedure. Can you be missing hidden injuries on your patient if you don't do this per se? And then the second part of this question for personal injury, and this is what doctors really want to know, can you be leaving money on the table by not diagnosing something like that? Yes and yes. So we have all what are called value drivers in personal injury. And one of the biggest value drivers, let me rephrase that, the number one value driver in all personal injury is diagnosis. So in page 23 of the sixth edition of the AMA guidelines, bottom left-hand corner, please look this up. It says the most important part about an impairment rating is a correct diagnosis, period. With an incorrect diagnosis leads to an incorrect impairment rating. So now you just lost out on two things. A diagnosis, which is M24.28, you need that on those first couple visits. Not only are you leaving $600 for eight minutes of your time on the table, now you've just dropped the ball on the beginning of the case to show the attorney, hey, here is this 25% impairment rating that we have before we even look at a discogenic lesion, but let's correlate that with an MRI slash the subjectivity in, in our offices. And now you're really setting the stage up for the attorney at the beginning of the case so they can sell this properly, this claim to the adjusters. Got it. Let me back up in just, just a minute because this popped in my head and uh, some of the viewers may have this question as well. Is that a diagnosis code that you gave uh, that M, tell me, explain that. I'm just, I'm gonna act like a lay person here. What is that code that you just gave a minute That's ago? A great question. So the CPT code book has hundreds of diagnoses. The CPT code for ligament laxity is M24.28. The old one used to be 728.4. So this is what happens on the CPT code book. They explain the diagnosis. It's a disorder of a vertebral ligament. That's the only description. So when I take a flexion extension view in my office and I visually see either a flexion or an extension subluxation or a translation of an anterior or a retro subluxation visually, it is M24.28 before I even plot the lines of mensuration because the CPT go book is not asking for a measurement. The AMA guidelines is asking for the measurement to qualify, recognize it, and to put it into those DRE categories um, for permanency. But as far as the CPT code book, it's a visual diagnosis. Got it. So you have a PI practice. You're still in practice, Todd, correct? Yes. So when you market to a new attorney, then you guys have never met. Do you show them a report? Obviously, you'll redact out the patient's name to you know, protect the privacy and all that. But do you show them in your initial meeting what your procedure does and how it differenti differentiates you from the market? Absolutely. So I show them George's line and I go over the four reasons why George's line is broken. It's very simple marketing slash education. There's four reasons why it's broken. It's either a fracture dislocation, which 99.9% .9 of the time is disqualified by the board certified radiologist. Then you only are left with two, either posterior osteophyte or ligament laxity. So once I educate them on those four aspects of why George's line is broken, and I show them George's line, that imaginary red line on the poster aspect of the vertebral body, then I say, this is what the opposing counsel and the opposing radiologist has no idea how to defend this. Here are the typical questions, and here are the questions that I present to you to show the defensive counsel that, or the defensive radiologist that they know zero about their own AMA guidelines because I'm really just regurgitating MD terminology from the AMA guidelines with a chiropractic flair.
Got it. Uh, all right, Todd, let me, or let me ask you this question. Give me a peek behind the curtain about what working with you is like. So let's say I, I have your software. So you sell a software platform, is that correct? Yes. So I have this platform. I have a PI patient. And here, here's another question. Do you use this specifically for, for PI patients or do you use it for your, your, maybe your cash or commercial insurance patients as well? I use it for both. I always use it for uh, trauma patients, slip and falls, and MVAs, any type of severe trauma. But here's the caveat. Whenever you have a patient that comes in, and nine times out of 10, you're not going to find this in the cervical region on a regular cash-paying family practice. But when you see it on the lumbars, you're going to see that vertebral offset. So you now you have to differentiate, is this still a ligamentous instability patient that's a regular patient? And or is there a PARS defect? Either way, from a liability standpoint, we still have to do flexion extension to differentiate those two. And then we go to the next diagnostic step, which is an MRI. So yes, I use them for both patients. Okay, so use them for both. So let's say I have your software and I have, for the purpose of this conversation, my PI patient. Uh, I take the three x-rays that you recommend. Um, I use your software to, well, explain to me. So I have these x-rays. What do I do with these x-rays now? How, how does the process work? So it's real simple. When you sign up with my uh, company, DXD Software, um, we're going to remotely jump onto your computer and we're going to load the software. That's number one. Number two is you're going to grab three x-rays from Mrs. Smith. So you know exactly how to import them. I have Dr. Jeff, who's my associate, who's going to train you to make sure you know how to import the x-rays, plot the points of anatomy, the four corners of the cortices and the spinal lamina line. It should not take you more than 30, maybe 40 seconds per view. And then we show you how to edit the points if you're off by a couple of slivers here or there. And then we're going to talk to you about the significance of those findings. After that, then I'm going to show you how to market this, not only just from a personal injury standpoint, but from a second opinion standpoint. So 10 years ago, um, I started doing what are called second opinions, where I go to these attorneys and say, I want you to send me the patient for a one-time visit, or you're just going to send me three x-rays. I'm never going to meet the patient. I'm going to do lines of mensuration for an unbiased permanent injury evaluation without even meeting the patient. You can send me MRIs. I can get an initial report from the treating doctor. And now I'm just unbiasedly looking at the x-rays, which to me is more bulletproof than meeting the actual patient. Right. Because for you, Todd, in your program, it, it, it's pay to play. In other words, it's per patient. Uh, and so you're not waiting on the lien. You're not waiting for settlement. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a fee. You do the work, you're paid, you have no vested interest in the outcome of the case. You're just there to diagnose what's on those x-rays. Absolutely. So it's an unbiased evaluation by the treating physician. And you're giving me a certain amount per month to do certain amount of patients or reports. The more you do, the cheaper it is, but the ROI is anywhere from four to one to 20 to one. But I'm going to hold your hand to make sure not only are you competent on the four corners of the cortices, because once that report leaves your office, you're representing yourself. And just as important, you're representing our profession. And then I'm going to teach you how to market this to those MRI reps that come into your office. You're going to ask them to introduce you to attorneys. I'm going to give you a custom PowerPoint so you can lecture to a small group to 50 to 60 attorneys at once. Nice. So you get one referral at the end of each of those one hour lectures. And now we're talking 10, 20 referrals in a one, one hour period of time. Awesome. So tell me about a typical uh, a testimonial of one of your clients. Like when they start with you, uh, you know, maybe talk about somebody that may have started with you six months ago. Uh, what does their practice look like now as far as, you know, average revenue? You, you mentioned, you know, average ROI from, you know, four to about 20. But in about six months time, what's a typical testimonial from one of your clients sound like? You're going to find out that, most doctors, when they start learning how to do the lines of mensuration, they're, they're going to realize that it's the most, it's the simplest uh, analysis. And all my competitors ask you to send their x-rays over there because they know how simple it is. But the difference between my report and everybody else's report is I cover medical necessity, description and procedure, 14 pages of research. And then over the next couple months, every time you do a report on a case that's attached to a, an attorney, you're going to put a little post-it note there and say, 
Attorney Smith, I want to have lunch with you so you can understand the significance of this and how this can affect the rest of your practice by sending me the second opinion clients, even if they're treating 10, 20 miles away, I want to see those x-rays. And that's where it magnifies as far as volume of patients. And more importantly, just as important, the financial ROI, because now you're educating them on lines of mensuration, the retro and anterior listhesis. And do you have to have a special certification to be a second opinion doctor or just because you have this ability and this software uh, to prove ligamentous instability? Uh, so that's the question. Do you need a special certification or you're a DC? You're, the, you're an expert. You're an expert already. What's great is I fall back a lot um, on these questions, which that's a great question. I always fall back on the AMA guidelines. AMA guidelines is referred in court as a learned treatise. A learned treatise means it's much savvier than you and I. It's been around the block for 50 to 60 years. And on page 23 on the top right-hand corner of the sixth edition, it states very specifically an MD, a DO, a DC, and a psychologist can perform an impairment rating. This is not a pathological report. This is an impairment rating. So either you can do signs and symptoms, MRI, range of motion, or AOMSI, which is alteration of motion segment integrity, which to me, scientifically based, reproducible, and it has the framework that is the simplest to explain to a jury, which only happens 2% of the time. Correct. And you're, the insurance company is going to pay you for this report. That's the amazing thing. So a lot of doctors say, hey, I get paid at the end of it for a final narrative. No, no, no. You're going to get paid at the beginning because you're going to talk about the AMA guidelines is asking me and recognizing and demanding that I do this. And the insurance company is going to say, here you go. Thanks for doing that because it's liability and you're getting all this diagnostic information. Interesting. Uh, that's awesome, Todd. Uh, I got to ask you this question here because I, I hear this from attorneys and I want to know if you've heard this before. The term ligament laxity versus the term ligamentous instability. Now I've heard from some attorneys, I went to this big attorney convention for marketing and they didn't like the term laxity because to let's say the jury of just lay people, laxity sounds like it's relaxed. It's just chilling out. It's pretty cool. That's how the lawyers were presenting it. Like I was in a room full of lawyers. I was just listening. Have you gotten any pushback about that, about the terminology laxity versus instability? Well, again, I like falling back on the AMA guidelines. So I liked using the words alteration, motion, segment, integrity. That's number one. Ligament laxity is oh, the just generic to back up, term. Why would you start throwing in that word instability? Instability to me sounds very sexy. And now we're talking about Georgia's line. So we're talking about an instability that something is moving too much. So I always relate this for marketing and more importantly to the jury is that when someone wipes out um, snow skiing and they come to your office, they dock, man, my knee's killing me, man. So what do you do? Real simple stuff. They're prone. You're twisting their knee. You're pushing down, checking for meniscus tears, and then you flip them over. And then what do you do? You do a drawer test. What are you looking for? You're looking for an instability, mm -hmm. but it's very easy because it's a knee and we're talking about a femur and a tibia. I push, I pull, I'm looking for gapping and or facial apprehension. Very simple to get that diagnosis, one, visually, two, um, from an ortho standpoint, but then you send them out for an MRI. When it comes to the instability of the spine, you can't palpate it. Mm -hmm. If you're the president of the motion palpation club, you cannot palpate instability. Don't think you can do that. And AMA guidelines is very specific. There's only two things that, that show instability. Looking down and looking up, period. And here's the caveat, and this is how you market it. And this is how you explain to a jury. The reason why the AMA guidelines in the fourth, fifth, and sixth edition love flexion extension is because it's a linear view. When it's a linear view, that means there's no coupled motion. You're going down and you're going up. Once we do this, once we do this, and once we do obliques, it looks sexy, but there's coupled motion. There's compensatory components. But when you look down and you look up, it's linear. There's no malingering. And here's my famous line. You can't fake a bone to move. You can't will a bone to move. You can't fake instability. It's a non-malingering test. You can exaggerate vast scales all day long. But when you have that instability, 
the sexy word, instability. Now we're showing something that the Sharpie fibers are involved, ALL is disrupted, and or the PLL, plastic deformation. You can use those other fancy words, but the AMA guidelines knows. And here's something, I'm going to give you a little, another marketing 101. This is a, a one-liner that I'd say probably 99.9% .9 of attorneys don't know, that you can get a 25 to 30% impairment rating with a negative MRI. Yeah, got it. Sixth edition, page 564, the URI category. It says AOMSI and or herniated disc. So the AMA guidelines understands that when you have an instability with a negative MRI, it will become a positive MRI. And I did a research study three years ago that I'm the author that had somebody with just a simple bulging disc. And two years later, I ordered another MRI and that bulging disc became a herniation mm -hmm. and the adjacent level became a bulge with those millimeters over 3.5, which is the threshold of 3.5 millimeters. So it's documented in the research, but I just wanted to do one with my DXD software highlighted and more importantly, my name, so I look smart. <laughs> well, you are smart, Doc. A uh, couple more questions before we finish up here. In your 14-page report, you said that there's research in that report that relates to this, this work that you train doctors on, correct? Yes, 23 references. So it references, in other, in other words, medical journals. So yes. defense attorneys can challenge you and you can use that report. Well, according to all these medical references, this process is, and I don't know what term you, legit. Yeah. So what I do is I fall back on the learned treatises and research, but whenever you fall back on that, it's all medically oriented. It's not a chiropractic thing. This is an AMA guidelines thing. And that's how I relay it to attorneys because a lot of attorneys always say, oh, that's a chiropractic thing. I go, no, it's not. This is a learned treatise. If you say learned treatise to an attorney, they perk up because now you know medical terminology. Uh, legal terminology. Uh, legal terminology. And when you say, use legal terminology to an attorney, you stroke their ego and they lean forward because now you're saying something in their wheelhouse. You're talking in their language now. Yes. That's awesome. Um, and then I have this other question for you, uh, Todd. Uh, talked about your 14 page report. Oh, we talked about if you get challenged by a defense attorney, uh, you, as a chiropractor doing this type of work, you mentioned, I think you said it was page 24 of the AMA guidelines, where it says this can be done by MD, DO, DC. Is that, is that correct? So if you get challenged- Yeah, so it's page 23 of the sixth edition of the AMA guidelines. So close, page 23, got it. Well, Todd, in closing here, how do we reach out to you? How do we contact you if we're interested in learning more uh, about your DXD software and how it could help not only create a point of differentiation for you as a treating doctor in the PI space, uh, but how, how, can we, how can we contact you if we want more information? Real simple. Call me on my cell anytime. It's 813-215-5581 or email me anytime. It's Todd, T-O-D-D, at C-I-E-L-O, chiropractic.com. I love it. And, you know, Todd, I wanted to talk about this, you know, just kind of, you know, we went to school together at the University of Florida and a lot of our friends were turned on by the chiropractic profession. And do you think it was because of all the PIP in Florida, the $10,000 of PIP? Because that's where you live. That's where we went to school. And like a lot of our friends became chiropractors. Just what do you make of that? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think Florida is an awesome state. Everybody's trying to get into the state. I think healthcare is phenomenal in Florida over the past couple of decades. Um, you know, I think from a human body standpoint, I love the human body. And, uh, you know, I boxed and wrestled in the University of Florida, you know, that stuff. Um, but I, I just think uh, from a from a healthcare standpoint, you know, we're here as servants and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we got to look out for our family. And and for me, you know, if I average eight hundred to a thousand dollars an hour in my practice, I'm doing well. Um, and I think Florida is a is an awesome state. And at the end of the day, they always taught us in school, um, Sid Williams goes, what makes you unique and different? And after 10 years of kicking butt, you know, in practice, I said, you know, I, I might have great gift of gab. I might have great healing hands, but from a documentation standpoint, what makes me different? 
and lines of mensuration. We took 500 freaking hours on that, you know, and the AMA guidelines highlights it. So to me, it's an AMA guidelines thing with a chiropractic flare thing that no one on the planet should know more about a subluxation. The difference is we adjust hypomobile subluxations and the AMA guideline says, this is a hypermobile instable joint. Please document this and categorize it because we're gonna put our stamp of approval on it. So why not do that and get paid? Love it. So just like in your lines of insuration, you're putting those little four dots on the vertebral body. So if we missed anything here, Todd, help me fill in the blanks. What can you add? Did I miss anything? Uh, and I also wanna talk about the benefit of the benefit, right? In other words, the benefit of using your software, no more misdiagnosis of ligamentous instability if it's there for the patient. So you're gonna be helping the patient more, uh, validating your treatment because unstable joints left untreated could cause long-term disability, correct? Yes. Yeah. So um, what else am I missing? What is the other benefit? Oh, and then more revenue, right? Your bills aren't going to get cut because your notes proved the traumatic injury was caused by the accident and you have the objective findings to, to, to prove it. So share some other benefits of the benefits by using your software, how it helps the patient and generating more revenue. I mean, that's probably the, the gold standard right there, helping the patient at maximum capacity and getting paid a fair fee for that work. I think you've covered um, a lot of the bases, but when it comes to personal injury, I think you have to start out on the right foot and you have to check all the boxes on the initial visit. I think the initial visit is crucial from a diagnostic standpoint, getting all the subjectivity out of the patient, putting that on paper, and then taking the appropriate simplicity of views, which is flexion extension neutral, because the AMA guideline says that, do you expect a, a discogenic lesion? Then you order the MRI, but now you've covered everything and you've given everything to the attorney in the first one to three visits on a silver platter saying, please understand what M24.28 means. And those types of diagnosis screams policy limits. So if you start out on the right foot, the attorney is going to appreciate that. Not only are they going to appreciate that from a short-term standpoint, but they're going to close the case quicker and then everybody's going to get paid. And when they get paid, that means you're going to get more referrals. Bingo. All right. Well, Dr. Cielo, thank you so much for doing this uh, interview. I'm sharing my screen right now. This, Todd, this is your website, dxdxray.com. Uh, obviously, your contact information is on there. Uh, great information about your program uh, is on here as well. So if you're interested in reaching out to Todd, dxdxray.com. That's his website. And you can see here, you have a lateral neutral flexion extension, the lines of insulation on there. And if you want to be different, if you want to stick out, if you're looking for a point of differentiation so that your Rocky Road ice cream, instead of just vanilla, like 80% of the other doctors out there begging for these patients, uh, give Todd a call if this is a route you want to go to create your point of differentiation in your practice. Todd, thanks for doing this for me, man. Thanks for having me on. Got it. Anything uh, else you want to end with? Or have we said um, it all? Well, one other thing is uh, there's two types of challenges in court. And again, you go to court 2% of the time. So any time that the opposing counsel sees something unique and different on the other side, they might do what is called challenge you. But here's the, here's the caveat to that. I've been challenged twice in the last nine years. One is a fry challenge, which I won in 2013, which is documented. And that's an easier challenge. The harder one is called a Dauber challenge, which I was challenged in 2016 because they're scared of me. They're scared of the testimony and they're scared of lines of mensuration. So after I was challenged for the second time and no doctors won two challenges in this country, I turned to the uh, judge. I said, judge, I'm sick of people being scared of me. And he laughed. And I said, I want this on affidavit saying that DXC software is sufficient, reliable and relevant and chiropractors are awesome. He laughed at me, he goes, I'll put all that on there, except that chiropractors are awesome. I said, I understand. <laughs> so I have that affidavit. So whenever a, another attorney, because when you market this and educate the attorney, this is something new that they've heard, but it's been around for a hundred years. And then you'll say, has this ever been challenged? You say, yes, the president has been challenged twice. Here's an affidavit 
that is a federal thing and that's going to make them feel warm and fuzzy. But at the end of the day, it's three x-rays. At the end of the day, it's the subluxation. And at the end of the day, the person who's backing you up is the AMA guidelines, mm -hmm. which is more valuable in court and in diagnosis than the green books. I hate to break the news to everybody. So <laughs> utilize a learned treatise. It elevates the credibility of our profession and decreases liability in your office. Great. Dr. Cielo, again, I'm so grateful that you uh, took some time out of your day to do this interview with me. I think uh, the content that you provided is it's a home run to create a point of differentiation or call it an X factor. What's going to make you different in your messaging and your conversations with attorneys? Uh, and this is a, 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 an exact example of how you can have a point of differentiation in your practice for personal injury. So Dr. Cielo, thank you again for doing this interview with me. Uh, Enjoy Florida. I hope I get down there soon uh, and see you. I love Tampa. Uh, but give Dr. Cielo a call, uh, DXD X-Ray, and uh, I will post all his contact information uh, across all my, all my groups, all my channels, and all that. So Dr. Cielo, thanks again. Thank you.